So, directions. I mean, we all think that we really, really like them. Uh, sometimes we don't think that we need them. Uh, but uh, when we don't follow directions, well, sometimes our food doesn't taste right. Or we don't get where we're going. Or that desk that we bought from Ikea doesn't turn quite out like the picture does. You know, some people rebel against directions, some people embrace them. And you know, sometimes it's a whole lot easier to follow directions when there's no pressure, right? When there's nothing going on and the things that in life are just kind of going smooth. But when you're following the same steps you always fall and you're looking for the song that you know is there, but it's not there, but everyone's watching. Well, then all of a sudden it's a whole lot harder than what it normally is, right? And so directions, it's always best to kind of read them beforehand. Have an understanding of what you're going to be working with when the time comes so that when it is crunch time, you know exactly how to handle the situation. You know exactly what to do. Well, you know, the Bible's full of lots of directions. There's a reason why God gives us his word and so that we can understand it. So we have time to think about it. Time to investigate it. And so that we're not left kind of right at crunch time when the pressure's on wondering, what do I do? Which way am I going to go? How is this going to kind of work out? A man named John is going to give us some directions today. Directions that can forever change your life. And so maybe in the, the peacefulness of this moment, while the world spins and kind of goes crazy around us, maybe in the peaceful of this moment you can listen to what he has to say. Maybe you can follow the steps or put into practice what he's going to suggest for us today. I hope that you are ready and willing to listen this morning to the words that are going to be shared with you today. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for today. And while the things that we have created to make our lives smoother and easier sometimes don't always work, we know that you do, that you are in control, that you are in charge, and that you have appointed this time for us, these people, this place, to hear what you want us to hear. And so, God, I pray that we will listen with ears wide open, that we will have hearts that are willing to receive, and that you will help us to understand that there is truth, your truth, that can forever change our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So over the last several weeks, we've been looking at the life of this man named John. And all John sought to do was point people to Jesus. I mean, that was pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And so I have a series of questions I'm going to kind of ask. Then we're going to look at some answers and kind of see what God's Word has to say for us. And so the first is this. Who was this John? I mean, there are several Johns in the Bible, right? But who is this one that we're going to be looking at? Well, we know him as the baptizer, John the Baptist. But the prophet Malachi said that John would be a messenger sent by God to prepare the way before him. So while, yes, he did baptize, his purpose was to point, to be a messenger. Well, why did the world need John, you might ask? Well, the prophet Isaiah said that the people were in a wilderness, a place that was like waywardness and sin. So there was stuff going on in their life that was difficult, making bad choices. And John, Scripture would tell us, would clear the way for the Lord. But not just clear the way for the Lord, he would also make the way smooth to him. So two ways there, two directions. Yes, he was going to prepare so that when God came, that everything was ready. But not just that, he was also going to make sure that the path to him was going to be smooth. So that he would be here to do what he is going to do, but yet it was also going to be possible for us to approach him. So I like that. And this was necessary because even though we know that God is love, and even though we know that love comes from God, the people desired their own way instead. 
I don't know why we do that, but you know, we do. God gives us this perfection that sometimes we desire our own way. Even though God took the initiative, even though God is approachable, even though God values everyone, that he gives opportunity to all, that he meets needs, and oh man, does he meet needs, that he helps people become more than what they could be by themselves, people, people like you and even me, we choose to settle for less. I mean, I can give you some background behind some of the stuff I just said. I mean, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Jesus came into this house, and nobody pointed out that she was sick. That wasn't even the reason why he went. He just noticed, and so he healed her. That's taking initiative. A leper comes to Jesus. You know, a leper, someone who's got this incredible skin disease, incredibly contagious, but yet Jesus allows this a leper to approach him, and Jesus doesn't recoil. Jesus doesn't push him back. Jesus heals him. Jesus comes across this guy named Matthew, this Jewish man who is a sellout tax collector for Rome. And instead of looking at him with scorn, he says, follow me. He valued him, saw something in him. And not just that, he gave the opportunity to lots of different people. Because as soon as Jesus said, hey, Matthew, follow me, Jesus went and ate with some of Matthew's friends who just happened to be other tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and other folks that were socially uncomfortable in life because he valued and gave opportunity to everyone. He fed the 5,000 and even took care of the Gentile woman and her daughter even though they were not a part of the kingdom. And so... Even though God does all of these things, we still choose to settle for less and say, you know, that's okay, maybe, but I'm going to do this instead. And so even though God offers the best life possible and a solid foundation that will truly stand the test of time, the people decided that instead of finding agreement with this God who loves, with this God who takes initiative, with this God who does all of these good things and provides us the foundation that we need for life, they instead said, no, I'm not going to agree there. I'm going to agree with just everybody else. Because, well, you know, I want to be like everybody else. And so that is why the world needed John to be able to point this way because as a result people like you and I we end up with hard and broken hearts because we know there's something better but we've rejected it we've decided to go all in with something that is less and as we do that time and time again we get scarred we get hard we get bitter, right? And then we get angry because our life is exactly the way we've chosen it to be. When God has offered us so much more. So what was God, John going to do then? Well, the prophet Malachi states this again. It says that John is going to restore the hearts of people so that they can be right with each other, so that they can be right with God. And he was going to do this by pointing them to the promised one. The one who can actually fix their hard and broken hearts. So it wasn't that John was going to be a miracle worker. It wasn't that John just had to know the five easy steps from the latest self-help book. No, it was that John was going to point them to the one that could fix everything. That could take care of everything. And John was confident about this because King David had said that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, that he saves those who are crushed in spirit. John was confident of this because the prophet Ezekiel said that the Lord would give them a new heart 
and that we put a new spirit within them. That he would remove this old heart of stone and he would give them a new heart of flesh. John was confident of this because the prophet Jeremiah said that the Lord would even write his law, his special words, his truth actually on their heart and place that within them. So when John saw Jesus, when John saw the promised one coming to him, this is what he said. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. One simple sentence. But man, this one simple sentence, these words, these words change absolutely everything. Because we go from the fact that there might be this promised one coming to the fact that this promised one is here. Behold, John sees him. John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John, like those before him, these other prophets, he chose to speak up. And he told everyone to pay attention. Because Jesus is this one who is going to restore these hearts. You have heard about him, but now here he is. And so John called Jesus the Lamb of God to help the people understand who Jesus was. See, the people knew that a lamb had been substituted for Isaac by God during Abraham's demonstration of faith. You know, way back in the Old Testament, you know, God said, go and make this sacrifice and take your son Isaac, and he did. And you're thinking, well, okay, what's going to happen? Because even the son asked, well, where is the sacrifice? And, and Abraham said, well, the Lord's going to provide, you know, knowing that it was going to be Isaac. But then when he gets up there and he gets ready to do this, knowing that if this is the son of promise that God can even do what? Raise him from the dead? That a lamb is caught in the thicket and is substituted. And so they knew this about a lamb. The people knew that a lamb had been used as an offering to protect Israel from death during the Passover. So our Jewish friends have just celebrated the Passover. The Passover was what? Well, they're freedom from bondage and slavery in Egypt where they sacrificed the lamb and they put the blood on the lintel on the doorpost and how they ate that offering prepared ready so they knew that the lamb was going to be what? It's going to protect them from death. But it was also going to be a sin offering because the law prescribed that a lamb was to be sacrificed every morning and every evening in the temple. And so John says, behold the Lamb of God. And so their minds start thinking about what the Lamb is. In fact, the people even knew a Lamb was used by the prophets to describe a suffering servant who would be innocent. He would be led to slaughter, whose blood would redeem all of those who had gone astray. And so John said Jesus within what? He would take away the sin of the world to help people understand what Jesus would do. So we see who he is. He's this lamb. But what is he going to do? Well, he's going to take away sin. And so the people knew that sin was more than a descriptive term. You know, that's the way we kind of use it, right? It's a descriptive term, a moralistic term. It just means something you're not supposed to do, right? Something that, well, maybe God or someone else just said it's not cool. But it's so much more than just a descriptive term. It was an action that originates from a personal desire rather than God's direction. You know what I'm talking about, right? When we choose to do it our way, instead of God's way. And you think, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is, is when we choose our way over God's perfect way, we totally miss the mark. I mean, we completely miss out on what's best for us. 
And so they understood that that's what sin was. Not just something you disagree with, but something that misses the point completely. Something where you completely miss out. I read this article uh, this week about the Wheel of Fortune. Now, I, I, I'll date myself. I remember when the Wheel of Fortune was uh, the game show where you actually bought prizes with the money, you know, and Pat Sajak would say, once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. Now we don't even do that. Now they just get the money and the prizes, which that's totally cool. More puzzles. But there was this controversy that happened because this one puzzle, the way you're supposed to say it, you can't add any extra words in it. And so the person was getting ready to win, and they added the word and, right? And you would think, well, he said everything right, except the rule says you can't add anything. And so it was wrong. He missed it. No money. See, missing the mark isn't just like, oh, I'm sorry, here you get part of it. It's missing the mark is you miss all of it. Totally incorrect. That's what sin is. It's the fact that we've missed the mark. We've missed it all. We've lost. The people knew sin offerings removed the guilt of a past sin. But John's proclamation indicated that all sin could be lifted away, that it could be raised up from the individual because of a single sacrifice that would have this ongoing effect, that it would remove sin and its penalty forever. So it didn't just cover it like it didn't happen. It was washed away like it was completely gone. And so they're starting to understand something different going on. The people knew that sin affected everyone. And deep down today, regardless of where you are in life, we know that sin has an effect. If you've been lied to, you know sin has an effect. If you've been betrayed, you know that sin has an effect. If something bad has happened to you, you understand what that gut punch feels like. There is an impact to sin, even though we try to pretend that there is not. And so what they see here is that everybody's affected, but it seemed to indicate that God would be treating the entire world as if they were his people, making his forgiveness and his promises available to all, not just a few, not just the Israelites, but you know, Gentiles, people like you and me today, thousands of years later. And so Jesus, what is he going to do? He's going to take away the sins of the world. So John then, he points us to Jesus, who came as one of us so that we could see his desire to what? Be near to us and to help us. Because, well, the people were hurting, right? Because they were in this wilderness where they were doing dumb stuff, you know, like us, like people like you and, and me. Because our desires, well, they were for our own ways. And our willingness, well, we chose to settle for less. In our ongoing choices to agree with the broken ideas and the ideals of society rather than God, do you see how we've kind of shaping this up? This sin has made our hearts hard and permanently broken and will ultimately lead us to death. I mean, that's what gets us with cardiovascular disease, right? Our vessels just aren't quite as warm and squishy as they used to be. They just don't work as well as they used to be. Our heart just doesn't work as well as it used to. And that ultimately causes death. And this is the impact that sin has on us. It makes us hard. It makes us brittle. It kills us. So Jesus substitutes himself in our place as an offering for our sin. To do what? To save us from death. Exchanging his innocence for our guilt. 
to redeem us and make us right by, catch this, giving us his life and taking upon himself our death so that our hearts can be made new, allowing us to live an abundant life by the words his spirit has placed within us because he took away our sin. And what I have told you plays out in front of all of history. Not just does it play out in front of all of history, this account has stood the test of time. See, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John they tell us these things this morning. Some of which you already know. And some of which you've already heard today. That Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And said to them, you brought this man to me who incites, who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he has sent him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. So that we see that Jesus is what? He is innocent. And he is innocent verified by many witnesses. That he is innocent just like that lamb that he is said to be. That now, Scripture continues, at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for those a prisoner, one prisoner who they wanted. At that time they were holding a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. So that when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Hey, who do you want me to release? Barabbas or Jesus, who's called the Christ? But the chief priest and the elders, well, they had persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to the death. They had their own agenda. And we see that the decision of the mob is always a good decision, right? But the governor said to them, well, which of these two should you want me to release? And they said, Barabbas. And so Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said, crucify him. So we see that Jesus is substituted an innocent or the guilty. Just like the lamb. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers, they took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side with Jesus in the middle. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus by night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, it was about 75 pounds worth of stuff. And taking Jesus' body, the two men, they wrapped it with the spices and the strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, that there was a garden. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So that we see here that Jesus is what? He is the sacrificial offering for sin. He is an innocent who has been substituted on our behalf and he has become the sin offering paying well, what we can't or what we at least would have taken our life. And so when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might anoint Jesus' body. 
Very early on, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? You know what they're thinking, right? This thing's huge. There's three of us. How are we going to even get what we bought to get in to do what we came to do? Which was show honor and love and respect. But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which I love the Bible, which was very large, just in case. And it had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting there, and they were alarmed. Okay, understatement, right? Wouldn't you be alarmed? The stone that you expected to be there is not where you expect it to be, and there is someone there sitting there. Yeah, I'm thinking I would have screamed at a girly scream. I mean, I'm just going to be honest, right? I mean, that's where we would have been. But he said, don't be alarmed. Calm down. He wasn't there filming it. He wasn't going to post it on social media. Wasn't going to be there to make fun of us forever. He just simply said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? See, I like that. He buries the lead. Instead of just saying, hey, he's risen. He's not here. He said, oh, yeah, Jesus the Nazarene, the one that's crucified. You're looking for him. He's not here. He's risen. Go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. Who's going ahead of you? Jesus is going ahead of you. There you will see him just as he told you. I mean, that's a pretty amazing thing. So we see that Jesus is raised up in the resurrection. Raised up. He's, you catch the significance? He's going to take away or raise up the sins of us, what we have committed, and now he is what? He is raised up in the power of the resurrection. That's significant because the power of the resurrection is what saves us from our sin. The wages of sin is death, but God has overcome death. He has been raised. He is now able to do exactly what he promised, which is what? Heal our heart. Heal our hurt. The power of the resurrection empowers all who believe to live rightly for God. Because there's a lot in God's book that I'm going to tell you. It's tough. It's some hard stuff. How do we know we're going to do that? How can we do that? It's in the power of the resurrection. When God overcomes death, he overcomes our death. When God gives us the power of the resurrection in our life, well, it doesn't just save us. It empowers us to live the best life possible while we are still here. This is why the Apostle Paul would later tell the people of Corinth that Jesus is the Passover lamb sacrificed for all. Behold. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So this morning, I just simply want to ask you a small handful of questions. What is it about having your own way that sounds better than a new and improved life in Christ by following Jesus? When you stack up your personal desires versus everything that God is offering you, why does this still look attractive? Why are you still desiring this? And here's the deeper question. Why are you willing to die for it? Right? If the wages of sin is death, then that means us pursuing our own desires is what we are telling the world, I want to die for. Eesh. That's ugly. Because I know what some of my desires are. You know what those desires that you have are that you're not wanting to verbally acknowledge right now. You willing to die for that? You don't have to. 
Because Jesus says, I will take that sin away and I will replace it and give you life. Why do you want to settle for less when Jesus offers more than you can imagine? I mean, but that's really what sin is, right? It's settling for something that completely misses the mark instead of getting something that is way, way better. I mean, I can give you an analogy. It's a really, really cheap analogy. I mean, but nonetheless, I mean, if you were given the offer of this really cool new shiny car or this really ugly junker, why settle when you don't have to? But what you're saying is, when we sin, when we try to do things our own way, is that I'm willing to die for this second-rate cheap junk instead of possess the awesomeness that God has granted us. Why? Why would I want to live a life of settling when I can live a life that is fulfilling? Last question for you this morning. How can anything that society offers be greater and be of greater worth than what Jesus has for you? Now, I know, there's a, not everything bad about the world is bad. Right? Not everything about the world is bad at all. But why would I want to settle for that? Why, why would I want that to be who I am? When God offers all of these other things, how we answer those three questions determines the outcome of our life. We can follow the directions of the world and we end up dead. We end up hurting. It's filled with suffering. Or we can follow the directions that God has given us for life and we find it fulfilling, abundant, purposeful, not always perfect to this side of heaven, right? I mean, I'm not trying to sell you something that's not real. As a Christian, I have suffered greatly. I have experienced pain. I understand that. Hopefully you do too. But if life comes at me that hard anyway, would I rather do that on my own, in my own ways, or would I rather experience that with the help, honesty, and purpose of Christ? I'd rather have it with Jesus. And I want you to know that life is better with Jesus. I know it's really hard to let go of what's known, right? Even if, even if it's bad. And so I can get up here and I can lay out a really good argument for you and tell you my God is so much better than our own stuff. But sometimes this is just hard to let go of. And Jesus understands that sometimes this is hard to let go of. That's why he tells us this. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I mean, because that's what the world does to us, right? I mean, it just presses us down. But he says, I'm going to give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So that means that even God's going to keep showing us how we can do this life in a better way. That it's something that we experience. Something that develops over time. He says that I am gentle and humble at heart, and I'm here to tell you that when the world teaches us its lessons, the world is not gentle and humble at heart. The world takes our head and rubs it in the dirt and says, I hope you learn this lesson, but I don't care if you do or not. But God says, man, I'm gentle, humble. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So this morning, we'll listen to John. Let Jesus take away your sin. I want you to know all you have to do is ask. That's all you have to do. If you'd like to be saved here in just a moment, if you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, today you can. I'm going to walk down these steps in a minute. I'm going to say a prayer. And if that's what you want, come and talk to me. And I will tell you about my Jesus and how he can forever change your life. I'll, often, I'll even do this. If that's too scary for you, I will literally be the last person to leave the building this morning. Come talk to me, and I'll be happy to tell you about my Jesus.
But you might be already saved this morning. You might say, Pastor, I, I know I'm a believer. I've been saved. I've been forgiven. Then I want to encourage you this morning to follow the example of John. What was John's role? He was a messenger, right? What did John do? He pointed people to Jesus so that they could what? Have their life restored. So that they could be healed and helped. Man, I want to encourage you, church, that that's what we need to be about doing. Man, we live in a world right now that could use a little healing, right? We live in a world right now that could use a little bit of help. Do you think maybe that's why God left us here? Instead of just proofing us to heaven when we got saved? So that your life can be a testimony of the awesome things that God can do? Scripture says this. So prepare your mind for action and exercise self-control. Because this is the message that the world needs to hear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's Jesus. That's the message of Easter. That is what the power of the resurrection can do for you today. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day, God. We thank you for allowing us to be here, God. I pray that we will follow the directions. I pray, God, that you will change our lives and show us how we can help others have their lives changed by you as well. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.